Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, and government leaders. We speak to each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome the journalist Marilyn Berger to the program today. Her career has been an exemplary one. Diplomatic correspondent for Newsday and the Washington Post, reporter for the New York Times, and White House correspondent for NBC, among her many postings. But you could say she's proudest of her two most recent works. Her new book, This is a Soul, The Mission of Rick Hodes, is about the personal and professional odyssey of a doctor who has spent most of his professional life treating patients in some of the poorest countries who have some of the most horrific diseases. The book has just been published by William Morrow. And her other project is being the de facto mother to Danny, a young Ethiopian boy she met in Addis Ababa and brought to Dr. Hodes for care, and who Dr. Hodes officially adopted. Danny now lives with Marilyn in New York. Welcome. Thank you very much. So tell me what took you to Ethiopia in the first place. It was a very odd story. I have a college roommate who lives 10 blocks from me and I don't see very much. And I went to college quite a while ago. And she called and said, do you want to have lunch? I've just been to Ethiopia. I said, sure. And she told me about this most extraordinary human being she'd come upon, and that is Rick Hodes. She said, this is a man who has been in Ethiopia 20 years, has been working at Mother Teresa's mission, although he's sent there by a Jewish group, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. He treats all people regardless of religion, but beyond that, I mean, there are doctors who do that. This man has taken 20 children into his own house, adopted five of them, and has given his entire life over to the people of Ethiopia. So did you go there with the idea of writing a book about him, or? The original idea was to write an article, but he was bigger than an article. Okay. And I was totally taken by him because he's both an excellent doctor with a gold-plated education. He's not one of these guys who couldn't make it in America. He was at the University of Rochester Medical School and Johns Hopkins. Uh, he is a great doctor. He's taught himself, he's an internist, he's taught himself to be an oncologist and a cardiologist. And he's funny and he's not sanctimonious and he loves his life. Mm -hmm. How did he go from um, being a middle-class Jewish boy growing up in Syosset, New York, to being a doctor treating uh, these 18th and 19th century diseases that most of us have, have never heard about in, in, in Ethiopia. He had to give himself an entirely new education in everything when he got there, but he was a boy who grew up in Syosset, Long Island, very typical Long Island family, went to a Long Island school, but even as a child, he somehow felt he wanted to do something. And he saw kids starving in Biafra when he watched television. He made himself into a committee of one to go around and collect money for the children of Biafra. Then in high school, he went on to tutor poor children in the city because it was more exciting than hanging around Syosset. He then went around the world and he saw all the suffering and all the pain and he thought the way he could make the best contribution would be to become a doctor. And so he took a pre-med course after graduating from Middlebury with a major in geography, went to medical school at the University of Rochester, and went to Ethiopia as a volunteer first in the 1980s when there was a horrendous famine, and which was the famine that brought us live aid. This was a very bad time. So he worked there, and while there, it was very interesting, his only connection to the world was the BBC. And he would listen to it, and on Saturday mornings, there was a rabbi who spoke, a very esteemed rabbi from England who had been a Holocaust survivor. And Rick said to himself, there's more to this religion than I had realized. He was very taken by the ethical and moral teachings of this rabbi. So he decided to study, and in the course of that study, he became an Orthodox Jew. Not the kind who wears the uniform of an Orthodox Jew, but an Orthodox Jew in belief. He was in Israel studying when he heard about the plight of the Ethiopian Jews. These were a sort of lost tribe of Jews 
who Israel decided to give a homeland. And they were sick and they were needy and Rick heard about them. And he wrote to the people in charge and said, look, I'm a doctor, I speak Amharic, can I help? And it was almost too good to be true that these people would come upon a doctor wanting to help who spoke the language. So they sent Rick to Ethiopia wondering if he was really okay. And so they gave him about a six week tour of duty. And that was 20 years ago and he's still there. Mm -hmm. And he sort of stumbled onto um, uh, Mother Teresa's clinic at Addis Ababa, which is where he came in contact with a lot of these children. Yes, when he was traveling the world, he first went to Mother Teresa's mission in Kaligat. And he was so taken by the sisters who worked there, their happiness, their calm. And he actually asked to meet Mother Teresa and did as part of a big group. And he then met Mother Teresa again when he was up at the uh, famine in the 80s. And she asked him to get America to keep helping. In any case, I think that's probably what drew him to the Mother Teresa mission in Addis Ababa. And there, there are 600 souls suffering from the worst diseases and children who kind of make their way to his door. He's become known as the American doctor mm -hmm. who can help. I was really impressed by the fact that in his clinic, which is just a basically a bare room, there's, and there's no other equipment other than a, a stethoscope and his two hands. And, and with these, he has learned to diagnose some of the most terrible diseases, tuberculosis of the spine, heart damage caused by rheumatic fever, uh, growth hormone deficiency, Hodgkin's disease, and cancer. He says he has the stethoscope and what lies between the two earpieces. It's his head. And he does not have any equipment, although he can call on equipment around uh, Ethiopia. There's not much. There are very few x-rays, CAT scans, mm -hmm. all things like that. But he has come to know how to deal with things. And he says that you have to use your brain and your hands to understand. There's a way of making a patient lie down so you can hear the heartbeat, so you know what the heart murmur is and what the cause of it is. Uh, many of the uh, cancers that he sees are so far gone by the time he gets to see them that it, it doesn't take too much to know. But I've seen pictures of kids who've had tumors from their chin down to here, and he can cure it. It's Hodgkin's disease. He gets drugs from India where he can get generic drugs. And for less than $1,000, he can cure Hodgkin's mm -hmm, disease. Mm -hmm. he, it sounds like, you know, uh, there's a lesson in that for doctors in, in, in some of the more developed countries and what he's doing. Well, one of the problems in the developed countries is we have had machines interfere between the doctor and the patient. And there's something in a doctor a doctor's laying on of hands in the appropriate way, it makes a patient feel better and it makes a patient believe that the doctor can help. When the doctor just says, go get a CAT scan or go get a, an x-ray, it doesn't do the same thing for the patient. And he knows that the patients he sees are fairly much out of hope. And so he tries to find ways to make them feel better. He tries to find ways to make them laugh. He's wonderful with kids. What role does his religion play in the difficult work that he does? It's a very interesting question. Rick was doing this work, as I mentioned, or something like it, before he became very pious, a very observant Jew. I think that certainly the Torah and the teachings of the Bible and of all the sages reinforce his desire to do right. I was speaking to a rabbi one day and she said, I think he's one of the 36 just men. The 36 just men are given to a generation to do right and to save us from, uh, what would I say? I don't want to say Armageddon, but to save the world. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you say in your book that, that in his view, Judaism calls its followers to study the Torah, to serve God, and to acts of kindness, which sounds like and, and also the importance of visiting the sick and of prayer. But it seems like he is really practicing those principles in he, his work. He certainly lives it. And I, I should mention that his work in Addis Ababa is, is fairly well organized now. But whenever there is a problem anywhere in his general area, which can stretch from Kosovo to Turkey, he gets sent out by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. He was in the refugee camps following the um, genocide in Rwanda. And 
he dealt with the most difficult cases. And he was also dealing with people who were the perpetrators of the genocide, because right. they were all being treated. He was sent to Kosovo during uh, the late troubles there, and he wrote to his doctors and his teachers in Johns Hopkins, and he said, I'm finally practicing Baltimore medicine. Everyone here is hypertensive and overweight. Wow. <laughs> and then he was sent to Turkey during one of the terrible earthquakes in eastern Turkey. And he said, I wish I could say I helped, but I really was bringing out dead bodies. Tell me about some of Rick's children. Uh, for instance, there was Bokit, who I think was the first. Bokit is a child, now, now a young man, who had dragged himself to Addis Ababa from the countryside. His parents, he had overheard his parents say he'd be better off dead because he was so very sick. And the child didn't understand what this meant. But he picked himself up and walked halfway and hitchhiked halfway and collected food to resell along the streets to get himself to Addis Ababa. And when he got there, someone in the bus station noticed that he was really ailing and sent him to Black Lion Hospital. This is a pretty miserable hospital, and it was probably worse then. And Rick was walking through one day, and he asked the nurses if there was anything interesting to see. And they said, you'd like to see Bokit. Bokit had severe heart problems. And Rick started to treat him. And he was very close to death. And one day, he had to run out to the International Medical Drugstore to get some Lasix, which would uh, release the fluid in his system. And that $10 that he spent probably saved his life. But Bogut continued to be quite ill, and Rick was called all the time by the nurses at the hospital. And finally, he figured it's easier to have him at home. So he took him in, and whenever Bogut came to his house, he was a new boy. He was much better. He played with the dogs. He was willing to eat. And so Rick let him stay there. And Rick says, I owe Bokit a lot. He taught me what it would be like to be able to give myself in my home to someone. And after Bokit, he brought others in. Mm -hmm. And he wound up with 20, 20 children living there, right? More or less. They, they kind of move they around. In, right. Some go to school. Some, go to, some are studying in America. Um, some grow up. Uh, finally had to take a second house to house them because the teenagers got sort of in the way. But it was, but it was typical, you know. A lot of the children, I was amazed at all the, that the children would go through to get to his clinic to try to get to some medical help. It is amazing, and now he's pretty well known, mm -hmm. and I will tell you a story about that in a minute. But sometimes he would just be walking through the uh, Mother Teresa clinic, and one day he saw two kids with matching backs, both like pyramids which was a clear sign of tuberculosis of the spine. I can now diagnose it, even though I've only worked with him a right. couple of weeks. American right. doctors never see this anymore. It's sometimes called Pott's disease. And he saw these two kids. The younger one, Dejeni, was taking care of the older one, Semenyu, because Semenyu was so frightened. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't talk to anybody. And Dejeni started bringing him food, and only then would he eat. And Rick saw them. He saw they had TB. He started treating them. And he wanted to get surgery for them, but you can't get that in Ethiopia. So he started writing around to doctors, and finally he found a, a hospital and doctors in Dallas who would treat him. But he couldn't go with them. He had to find people who would oversee him. So he wrote to a Jewish, he called a Jewish newspaper, and the Jewish newspaper, he said, I'd like to put an ad in to see if there's somebody who will take care of these kids while they have surgery. And the woman said, oh, that's a wonderful story, but don't put an ad in. Call Janie Schultz. Janie Schultz is a woman who everyone seems to know in Dallas. And he told her his story, and she said, oh, I'll take the kids. And so she kept them for six months. Wow. And they had their surgery. They recovered, went back to Ethiopia. Now, Dejeni is in an excellent school in North Carolina, and Semenyu has graduated high school and is at Earlham College. Wow. Now, these kids would not have lived if it hadn't been for him. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with more with Marilyn Berger, author of This is a Soul, The Mission of Rick Hodes. Mr. Newsworth says, Fuzzy Nuts Bars, how many trees in the 
The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Marilyn Berger, author of This is a Soul, The Mission of Rick Hodes. It's just been published by William Morrow. You know, it really seems like a major part of, of Rick Hodes' life is being a hustler, hustling up, you know, doctors to perform necessary sur surgery, hustling up drugs, hustling up people to escort these children to di different places where they can get their surgery done, hustling up people to adopt them, you know, and you know, to adopt them when necessary. Well, he doesn't get into the adoption oh, business, okay, but okay. he does spend about 24 hours a day with catnaps in between sending studies out of kids who need surgery of one sort or another or medication of one sort or another. There was a girl recently who had heart surgery in LA. There are um, hospitals in India who are helping him. Uh, he's sending people everywhere. In Min Minneapolis, there is a neurologist who's done some wonderful things for mm -hmm. him. So what he does is he sends the studies out. He gets an x-ray, he does blood tests and says, look, I have this patient. This is what he needs or she needs. And he always includes a photograph. The first thing he does when he gets a new patient is take a pic have a kid sit up against a blank wall, take a picture, and tells him he has to smile. And the doctors always say, why are you sending me a photograph of the kid? And he says, this isn't just a back. This is a soul. And the fact is, he does treat the whole human being. And that's what's so wonderful about him. But he does spend his nights on a very slow internet connection trying to get to people. He does try to find places where he can buy drugs as cheaply as possible. He tells a wonderful story of what he thinks miracles happen. He says, if you're not religious, you think it's a coincidence. If you're religious, you think it's a miracle. He was walking through the hospital one day and was saying to someone, what this kid needs is pomidronate, and I need it, and it's made by Novartis, but it cost $3,000, I don't know, if it was a month or whatever. He said, I don't have the money. And a white guy taps him on the shoulder and says, did you say Novartis? And he said, yes. He said, I work for Novartis. What do you need? And Rick got the medication right, for two right. years for the kid. So he does hustle. Then he comes to America, and he speaks to groups, and groups who hear him want to help. In fact, I have a note at the back of the book that says, if you want to help Rick Hodes, this is the way to do it. And because he's sent there by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, they send him whatever is contributed to him straight without any administrative costs. Then he came upon this other angel, a very great doctor who's the chief of spine surgery at the Hospital for Special Surgery here in New York. His name is Dr. Ohenaba Bawachi. He was born in Ghana. He was helped by a Western, phys Western trained physician and now goes back twice a year to operate on African children, free. These are operations that would cost $100,000, $150,000 in America. And teams of doctors go with him because they want to work with him. He's very innovative and inventive and very kind. And when Rick was able to hook up with him, it helped him a huge amount with his back uh, right. patients, the TB or scoliosis, and he sends about 30 patients a year to Dr. Bawachi. So how'd you meet Danny? Danny. I was in Ethiopia following Rick, seeing what he did, and one day, out of the blue, I decided to walk back to my hotel, which is very unusual, because I may have mentioned to you I have a very bad foot. Anyway, I'm walking down the street, and I see a child looking up at me with the most beautiful eyes, the longest eyelashes, the handsomest face, and a back humped out that I knew immediately was tuberculosis of the spine. He was looking up at me with his hand raised, and I wanted to give him money, and the woman I was with said, you're not supposed to give money to beggars. You should help the organizations that help him. But anyway, the kid stayed with me in my mind. And I went to Rick, and I said, Rick, I found a kid. He said, yes, <laughs> there are a lot of kids. I said, he has TB of the spine. He said, let's go find him immediately. 
We went, found him. Rick took him back to the clinic, took a photograph, examined him with his stethoscope, and put his hand on his shoulder, looked over the shoulder at me, and said, Marilyn, you've just saved a life. Well, the kid just got under my skin. I liked him a lot. But Rick, he, Rick finally took him into Mother Teresa's, because he was a homeless child. Right. Took him into Mother Teresa's, then took him into his own house, got him surgery with the Dr. Bawachi's group, and Rick was coming here, and I said, why don't you bring Danny here? He can learn some English while he's recuperating, because he doesn't let them go to school after surgery. And he brought Danny, and the month he came, we got a diagnosis that my husband, Don Hewitt, was dying of cancer, pancreatic cancer. So I had to send Danny away for a month, but when he came back, Don had had his surgery. We got to know him. We got to love him and decided to see if there was a way that we could keep him here. And so Danny came into my life as my husband was leaving it. So it was one of the miracles that Rick seems to perform. And I was able to get a student visa for Danny, so I figure he can stay with me until he gets out of Harvard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, in a sense, I mean, losing your husband and getting, getting Danny, is, is that one of those instances when people talk about one door closing, another one opening for you? I almost use that as a dedication, mm -hmm. that idea. It's not only a door that's opened for me. Uh, you have to realize that I am over 70 years old. I never had a child, and I am really learning on the job. I've never done this before. Mm -hmm. He's an easy kid, but he, it's, it's a wonderful adventure. Is Rick Holtz the most religious person you've ever met? No. No. Well, perhaps he does more of what religious people are supposed to do than anyone I've ever met. Uh, and he is a very observant Jew, but he is a rollickingly observant Jew. For example, he has Shabbat services on every Friday night, and first they sing If I Had a Hammer, because he likes the feeling that right. it gives to people. <laughs> and then they say some Hebrew prayers, and then he blesses all the kids, and they take out the most outlandish hats you've ever seen out of a bag they keep in what is like a fireplace there. And people wear funny hats and have a great time and celebrate Shabbat. So yes, he is the most religious person in the sense that he does what religion teaches you to do. Mm -hmm. Is he the most religious? I don't know. He certainly sounds like one of, one of the happiest, most fulfilled people. You know, there have been studies made that people who do good, people who are altruistic and compassionate, are happy people. It's been seen with a lot, and in fact, there are studies going on now, both there's an institute at Stony Brook, there's an institute at Stanford looking into altruism and what can foster it. And in Vancouver, they're making a study in trying to make the whole city altruistic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how has Danny changed your life? Totally. I should say, I wasn't going out a whole lot when Don was sick and he had had some surgery before that, and I'm very much a homebody anyway, so I do stay home a lot. I used to be a night person. I can't stay up very late anymore, and the only sacrifice in having a child, in my opinion, is having to get up early to get him to school. Right, right. Uh, one woman said to me, you know, if you take this kid and you'll never go out again, and another friend said, you've been out. And I have had a very full, exciting, interesting life with a great deal of travel, a great deal of interest. And now it's the first time in my life I have time to dedicate to a child. And it's a thrill for me. What do you want people to take from this book? I think there are lessons in what Rick does in that if you help people, you are going to be fulfilled. I would also like something to happen with this book that happened with Three Cups of Tea. When Greg Mortensen first looked for money to help build schools in Afghanistan and Pakistan, he got one contribution of $100 from Tom Brokaw. After his book came out, the post office in his little town couldn't keep up with the envelopes coming in. Small contributions. But Rick always says small amounts of money can go very, very far in Africa. I gave a book to a young man who takes care of Danny every now and then, and he gave me an envelope with the price of the book, and he said, 
Please give this to Rick. He says he can do a lot with a little. I would like people to know that. I'm not out raising funds for him, but I would like to know that every penny that he gets go, is really used well. And so is Danny perfectly uh, healthy now and are his Danny health problems passed? A little, his, his illnesses are passed. He's going to have a little more corrective surgery, but Danny is a wild soccer player. He is taken up American baseball, is crazy about it. And you're a soccer mom at the age of 70. Isn't that plus. awful? <laughs> I know. I am a soccer mom. And I, I happen to be Jewish, and I thought, oh, my, this poor kid had to come all the way from Ethiopia and have a Jewish mother. But I am very, very proud of him, and I feel I can be because I can't take credit for it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a wonderful story, both of, of Rick Hodes and of you and, and Danny. And uh, I think a lot of people are going to enjoy reading about it. I want to thank Marilyn Berger for joining us today. This is a Soul, The Mission of Rick Hodes has just been published by William Morrow for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy.